Amen. All right, well, we're there in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. You can keep your place there in 2 Timothy and go with me back to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 1. Make sure you keep your place there in 2 Timothy 3. We're going to be going back and forth a lot between 2 Timothy 3 and Romans chapter 1, and we're going to hit a lot of other passages as well, but those will be the, probably the main ones for tonight. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and Romans chapter number 1. Tonight, we are continuing our, ter- our two-part sermon series on the subject of psychopath reprobates. If you remember this morning, we talked about how we're uh, filming for a documentary that we're making on the subject of psychopath reprobates. And if you're here tonight and you were not here this morning or you didn't hear this morning's sermon, uh, you, you may feel like you're coming into the middle of a movie, all right, or the movie of a do- or the middle of a documentary, uh, maybe the middle of a conversation. Uh, if you did not hear this morning's sermon, I, I would really encourage you to go back on our website and listen to this morning sermon in order to give this sermon context. You may not uh, understand everything we're talking about. I don't have time to go back and re, you know, go through the foundation that was laid this morning on this subject, uh, but I would highly encourage you, uh, you can go on our YouTube page, you can go on our, on our website, and uh, go back and listen to this morning's sermon if tonight's sermon doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Uh, but let's just real quickly do uh, just a really fast review from this morning's sermon. I get, like I said, I can't go through everything. But as we were talking about reprobates and psychopaths, what we found uh, this morning was that they're both without a conscience. We learned that uh, psychopaths are diagnosed as people with no conscience, while reprobates are also, uh, the Bible teaches that they are, uh, have no conscience. Both psychopaths and reprobates are ruthless predators. We saw that from the experts, and we saw that from the Word of God. And then, of course, both psychopaths and reprobates are without hope of reformation. They cannot be reformed. They cannot be fixed. And again, I would encourage you to go back to this morning's sermon uh, for a reference on all of those things. Tonight, we're going to deal with the specific characteristics that both psychopaths and reprobates share. And here's what I need you to understand about that. Psychopathy is a syndrome. Now, the word syndrome means a group of symptoms that consistently occur together or a condition characterized by a set of associated symptoms. If you remember uh, this morning, we were talking about when it comes to psychopathy, we were uh, having uh, Robert D. Hare, the doctor, the psychiatrist, who's the expert on psychopathy. He's a worldwide expert. He's the man that, uh, you know, everybody goes to when it comes to learning about psychopaths. And we, we looked at what he had to say about these things. Let me read a few. I'm going to read a lot more things from this book for you tonight. But let me read to you what he says about psychopathy as a syndrome. Uh, Psychopathy, uh, this is what he says in page 25, is defined as a cluster of both personality traits and socially deviant behaviors. In in, In page 34, excuse me, he said, be aware that people who are not psychopaths may have some of the symptoms described here. Many people are impulsive or glib or cold or unfeeling or antisocial, but this does not mean they are psychopaths. Psychopathy is a syndrome, a cluster of related symptoms. In page 69, he said this, a diagnosis of psychopathy is made only when there is solid evidence that the individual matches the complete profile. That is, he has most of the symptoms described. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Psychopathy is a syndrome. And what's, what you need to be careful about, you know, when you hear sermons like the one from this morning, or if you were to read a book like this one, is that as they give you the characteristics of a psychopath, those characteristics can be found in a lot of people who are not psychopaths. And here's what you need to understand. Just because you can maybe identify. See, some of you went home this afternoon, and you're looking at your husband you know, and thinking, I wonder if this guy, or you're looking at your wife, or you're thinking about your cousin, or whatever, and here's what you need to understand, because I'm going to give you a whole list of the characteristics of psychopaths, reprobates tonight, but here's what you need to understand. Any one of these, or two of these, or three of these can be found in normal people, okay? When someone gets diagnosed as a psychopath, is when all of these as a cluster, a syndrome, are found in one person. That's what makes somebody a psychopath when you can identify all of these or the vast majority of these in their lives. Now, what's interesting, because the whole point of the sermon is connecting psychopaths and reprobates. The sermon is called Psychopath Reprobates. And we're talking about how the Bible has taught the doctrine of reprobates, and it's basically what science today tells us are psychopaths. In Romans chapter number 1 and verse 28, 
the Bible teaches this kind of cluster of syndromes idea for reprobates as well. Notice Romans 1.28. The Bible says this, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with, I want you to notice this word, all. Being filled with all. Now, what he does is he goes on to give us a list of the characteristics of a psychopath. Unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness. I'm sorry, the list of a reprobate. Unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedience to parents. Now, oftentimes people will ridicule us when we preach on the subject of reprobates. When you look at this list here and people will say, oh, what? Just if someone's disobedient to their parents, does that make them a reprobate? But here's what you need to understand. In the same way that a psychopath has uh, shows in their life a cluster of all of those symptoms together, the Bible teaches the same thing. See, it's not yet, yet that they have these you know, different things in their life. Notice verse 20, 29. It says, being filled with all. And then it goes off and gives you this list. What the Bible is saying, it's not that any one person who does any of these things, they have envy or murder or they are backbiters or they are disobedient. It's not that anybody who does any one of these things is a reprobate. But listen to me, someone who is filled with all of these things is a reprobate. I mean, could you imagine meeting someone that had all of these characteristics in their life where you could identify every single one of these things? And that's what the Bible is saying. So, when it comes to psychopaths and when it comes to reprobate, you can find all of these characteristics in non-reprobate, non-psychopath people, but the difference is that you will find all of these characteristics in a psychopath reprobate. So before you start diagnosing everybody you know, you know, as being a reprobate or being a psychopath, you have to understand that a true diagnosis for a psychopath is someone that has all of these characteristics in their life. And in the same way, the Bible says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, and so forth. Now, tonight what we're going to do is this. We're going to look at what the experts tell us are the characteristics of a psychopath, and then we're going to see if we can find evidence in the Bible that reprobates share the same characteristics. So we're going to look at the psychiatrists who say, here's what a psychopath is, here's what they do, here's what their life looks like, here are their characteristics, here is their personality, and then we're going to look at what the Bible says about reprobates. Now what's interesting about that, good night, I tell you guys to sh check your phone. Why do people call me while I'm preaching? All right. Somebody from Colorado. All right, so, you know, what we're going to look at tonight is we're going to go through the list of the characteristics of a reprobate and see if we can match those up. Now, what's interesting, and we already did this, so I'm not going to go back and, and do it. We looked at the fact that there are several passages that teach us on the subject of reprobate. We got Romans 1, we got 2 Timothy 3, we have Titus 1, 2 Peter chapter 2, and Jude. We've already went through all those passages and showed how they all deal with reprobates. What's interesting about those passages is that they all also have a list of characteristics of psychopaths. So it's actually pretty easy to go back and see, well, here's what God says a reprobate does. Can we match that up to what the shrinks say, to what the psychiatrists say, to what the psychologists say that a psychopath does? Now, let me just say this. Why? Why learn the characteristics of a psychopath reprobate? Well, you know, uh, Dr. Hare puts it well in page six of his book. He says this, a major part of this quest has been a concerted effort to develop an accurate means by which to identify psychopaths among us. For if we can't spot them, we are doomed to be their victims, both as individuals and as a society. See, the reason that we want to learn the characteristics of these people is because if you can't spot them, if you can't identify them, if you can't figure out this is a psychopath reprobate, then you are doomed to be their victim, both as an individual and all of us collectively as a society. So let's go through the characteristics. What do the experts tell us 
are the uh, characteristics of a psychopath. And, and I don't have these in any particular order. We're just going to go through them. Uh, uh, you know, these, these are some that the psychiatrists tell us. This is what a, psycho, a psychopath looks like. Number one, they are covetous and materialistic. They are covetous and materialistic. In page 134 of the book, the experts write this. They, they said this. Their self-image, talking about psychopaths, their self-image is defined more by possessions and other visible signs of success and power than by love, insight, and compassion, which are abstractions and have little inherent meaning for them. So they identify their lives through their possessions and visible signs of success. When the psychopaths are interviewed, when they go to prison, the ones that are violent, and they are interviewed about their crimes, about their relationships, uh, about you know, their lives, they often speak only in the terms of materialism. And that's why I tell you, when you listen to somebody talk and they only speak in terms of money and resources and materials, you are, it's very likely that you are talking to a psychopath. Because most people, when you ask them about life and about relationships, they'll tell you about the relationships they have and the emotional attachments. But a psychopath will speak only in terms of the material. Here's an example. A, a psychopath will be asked, you know, who's, who's being interviewed in prison about, you know, the, why they, they killed somebody or how they feel about killing somebody or what do they think about, you know, the person's family of the individual they killed. And instead of speaking to the emotion or speaking to, you know, guilt or regret or I feel bad, they'll say things like, well, you know, I just wanted what they had and that's why I killed them. And they speak only in terms of the material. That's the only thing that matters to them. Now, here's a question. The experts tell us a psychopath is covetous and materialistic. Now, again, there's lots of people that are covetous and materialistic. So just because someone's covetous doesn't mean they're a psychopath. But that's one of the characteristics in an entire syndrome that you'll find in a psychopath. Here's a question. Can we find that same characteristic in a reprobate? Well, you're there in Romans chapter 1. Look at verse number 29. Romans chapter number 1 and verse 29, notice what the Bible says, being filled with all, right? And then he goes on to give us the list of characteristics of a reprobate. Notice what he says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, look at this word, covetousness. So on the list of reprobates in Romans 1, we see this word, covetousness. Can we find it anywhere else? We'll go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Now remember, Romans 1 talks about reprobates, and we get a list of their characteristics. 2 Timothy talks about reprobates, and we get a list of their characteristics. Let's look, let's see if we can find materialistic or covetous on that list. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 2. 2 Timothy 3, 2. The Bible says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. We've already looked at this passage. We've already proved it's talking about reprobates. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Notice, covetous. So on the list, on 2 Timothy 3, we see the word covetous. On the list in Romans 1, we see covetousness. Go to Titus chapter number 1. Just one uh, book over. If you're there in 2 Timothy, just go over to Titus chapter number 1. Look at verse number 11. Again, we've already seen that this is a passage in reference to reprobates. Notice what the Bible says, Titus 1.11, "...whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not." Why? For filthy lucre's sake. What's lucre? It's money. Why do these false prophets teach things that they ought not to teach? Why? They do it for one reason, for money. Look, the false prophets, you say, what's a, what's a false prophet? Who's a false prophet that teaches things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake? That's your Kenneth Copeland's. Amen. That's your Joel Osteen's. That's your T.D. Jake's, all right? These are... False prophets who are teaching things which they ought not. Why? For filthy lucre's sake. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter, you're there in Titus. You're going to go past Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. And by the way, you may want to put ribbons or bookmarks or bulletins or something in all of these passages because we're going to leave them and we're going to come back to them, all right? 2 Peter chapter number 2. Look at verse number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. And through covetousness... Shall they, with feigned words, 
make merchandise of you. So you know what false prophets do? They preach for filthy lucre's sake, and because of their covetousness, they actually make merchandise of the house of God, of the people of God, and that's one of the descriptions of a false prophet reprobate. Look down at verse number 14, same chapter. 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 14. Notice what the Bible says. Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Notice what the Bible says. In a heart, they have exercise with covetous practices. So notice, almost every list that deals with reprobates, God emphasizes their covetous, their covetousness, the fact they do things for filthy lucre's sake, the fact that in their heart they have exercised covetous practice. So when we're connecting psychopath to reprobates, is the biblical teaching of a reprobate what the psychiatrists today call a psychopath. Well, you go to the psychiatrist, you say, what is a psychopath like? What are the characteristics? And the first thing they're going to say, well, you got covetous, materialistic people. Then we go at, to the Bible and say, well, are reprobates covetous? And it's very clear they are. So they both share that characteristic. So I'm going to give you 10 tonight. One out of 10, check. They both got it. Here's number two. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Number two, they are proud, egocentric, and grandiose. Psychopaths are proud, egocentric, and grandiose. On page 38 of the book, Without Conscience, the writer says this, Psychopaths have a narcissistic and uh, grossly uh, inflated view of their own self-worth and importance. A truly astounding egocentricity and sense of entitlement and see themselves as the center of the universe as superior beings who are justified in living according to their own rules. On page 38, he continues to say this, psychopaths often come across as arrogant, shameless braggarts, self-assured, opinionated, domineering, and cocky. So according to the experts, Psychopaths are not only covetous and materialistic, but they are proud, egocentric, and grandiose. So here's a question. Are reprobates proud, egocentric, and grandiose? Well, go to Romans 1. Look at verse 29. Remember the list. Being filled with all, right? And he goes over the list. Look at verse 30. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, don't miss this, proud boasters. So look, when you go to the experts, they say psychopaths are proud egocentric, grandiose. When you go to the Word of God and say, is a reprobate proud? Is a reprobate egocentric and grandiose? The Bible tells us in Romans 1, in Romans chapter 1, that they are proud boasters. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, don't miss this, Boasters, proud. You see that? Boasters, proud. Look at verse 4, same chapter. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3 that they are boasters. They are proud. They are high-minded. Romans 1 says they are proud. They are boasters. Psychopaths are proud, egocentric, grandiose. So we got two characteristics of a psychopath. They're covetous. They're materialistic. And they're proud, egocentric, grandiose. When we match that up to the Word of God and we see, are reprobates covetous? Yes. Are reprobates proud? Yes. We got two out of two. All right, let's look at the third one. Go, uh, go back to Romans chapter 1. We're going to go back and forth between Romans 1 and 2 Timothy 3. Here's, here's characteristic number three. Lack of empathy, remorse, or guilt. Lack of empathy, remorse, or guilt. Remember, these people have no conscience. Nothing that tells them, hey, that's wrong. I shouldn't cross that line. That's a line that should not be crossed. These people don't have that. They lack empathy, remorse, or guilt. Here's what the expert wrote on page 6. These examples also illustrate a frightful and perplexing theme that runs through the case histories of all psychopaths, a deeply disturbing inability to care about the pain and suffering experienced by others. In short, a complete lack of empathy, the prerequisite 
for love. So according to the experts, they have a complete lack of empathy. He also wrote this on page 99 about psychopaths. He says, they give little thought to the pain and humiliation experienced by the victim. So here's a question. If a psychopath lacks empathy, remorse, or guilt, can we see in the Bible where a reprobate would lack empathy, remorse, or guilt? And remember that uh, Dr. Hare said that when you lack empathy, that's the prerequisite for love. The, way that you, the reason we love is because of the fact that we have the ability to, to have empathy. Notice Romans chapter 1 and verse 31. Notice what the Bible says. Without understanding, covenant breakers, don't miss this, without natural affection. They don't have the natural affection that you and I would have for your child or for your spouse or for just another human being when you're seeing them in pain and hurt. Hey, reprobates are without natural affection. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 3. The Bible says this, without natural affection. Without natural affection. So a psychopath is covetous. A reprobate is covetous. A psychopath is proud. A reprobate is proud. A psychopath lacks empathy, remorse, or guilt, and reprobates lack empathy, remorse, or guilt. They're without natural affection. Now, go to the book of Ephesians, just real quickly. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians. And when you get to Ephesians, put a ribbon or a bookmark there, because we're going to come back to that one too, okay? But, but, but no, we're going to come back to it, and then we'll be done with it, uh, not like Romans and 2nd Timothy. While you go there, let me read for you just a little more about this lack of empathy, remorse, or guilt. On page 41 of the book Without Conscience, it says this, Before his execution, serial killer Ted Bundy spoke directly of guilt in several interviews. Whatever I've done in the past, he said, you know, the emotions of omissions or commissions doesn't bother me. Guilt? He remarked in prison, it's the mechanism we use to control people. It's an illusion. It's a kind of social control mechanism, and it's very unhealthy. So here you have Ted Bundy, who, you know, killed, I mean, literally would break into women's houses and beat them to death in their sleep. He's a rapist and a necrophiliac. He's a pedophile. And he is lecturing us on the fact that, you know, guilt's not a real feeling. You know, guilt is just a mechanism that society uses to make you do things. Hey, why would he say that? Because he's without natural affection, that's why. Because he, does, he doesn't understand what it means to empathize or to feel guilt or to feel remorse or to look at somebody who's in pain and hurting and to be able to connect with them. Are you there in Ephesians 4? Look at verse 18. Now, Ephesians 4, 18 is talking about a reprobate. Notice what it says. Having the understanding darkened. Does that sound like the passages we looked at about the Pharisees earlier? Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts, notice verse 19, who being past feeling have given, them, given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Look, the Bible says that they are past feelings. They cannot, they, they cannot feel the same thing you and I feel. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 10. 2 Peter uh, chapter number 10. 2 Peter chapter number 10. You know what? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having you go there a little uh, premature. Go, go back to Romans 1. Go back to Romans 1. Let me read to you another, another passage from the book, just illustrating the idea of lack of empathy. Because what would lack of empathy, guilt, or remorse look like in an individual? They tell a story. It says this. A nightmare driver plowed into a car and killed a mother and her small daughter. Witnesses reported that the driver was rude and obnoxious after the accident. He was only concerned about it causing him to miss a date. In the ambulance... With one of his victims, a badly injured two-month-old baby, the driver, who showed no evidence of alcohol or drug use, reportedly responded to the baby's cries with, Can you shut the blank kid up? That's what someone who has no empathy or remorse or, or guilt will act like. They, I mean, he just killed a mother and a child. There's a baby, you know, in pain, and he's just upset. Why? Because it's going to cause him to miss a date. And this is what these reprobates are like. They're without natural affection. 
They are past feeling. So what is a psychopath, according to the experts? They're covetous and materialistic. What is a reprobate, according to the Word of God? Covetous and materialistic. What is a psychopath, according to the experts? Proud, egocentric, and grandiose. What is a reprobate, according to the Word of God? Proud, egocentric, and grandiose. Number three, the, according to the experts, they lack empathy, remorse, or guilt. What does the Bible say about reprobates? They lack empathy, remorse, or guilt. They're past feelings. They are without natural affection. Go, uh, go, go back to, to Romans chapter number one. Let me give you the fourth characteristic. The fourth characteristic of a psychopath is they are non-dependable and lacking in loyalty. They are non-dependable and lacking in loyalty. Here's what the experts write, uh, wrote on page 62. Are psychopaths particularly well-suited for dangerous professions? Now, the reason they're asking that is because the fact that psychopaths are often cool under pressure because they don't have feelings like fear or anxiety the way you and I do. And by the way, that's often why psychopaths are able to get away with serial murders. Because, see, if you killed somebody and you had to get rid of the evidence, you would be all, you know, frantic and anxious and scared that you're going to get caught and you'd be freaking out, you know, and you'd be like, oh, no. And that would cause you to maybe mess up, to not clean up thoroughly, to not do things. But psychopaths, when they carve a person up, like we read earlier, it's, it's, like, you're, for, it's like for us the same emotions of carving a turkey on Thanksgiving. You know, there's just no anxiety. They're very cool and under pressure, which is why they're able to, you know, just do crime after crime and not get caught for a long time. You know, so the question is asked, are psychopaths particularly well-suited for dangerous professions? Here's the answer. It is just as unlikely that psychopaths would make good spies, terrorists, or mobsters simply because their impulsiveness, concern only for the moment, and lack of allegiance to people or causes makes them unpredictable, careless, and undependable, likely to be loose cannons. See, you say, well, couldn't we use a guy that's cool under pressure, that can cut somebody up and not give it a second thought? Couldn't we use that guy like a spy? Well, the problem is that another characteristic of these psychopaths is that they're not loyal to anybody. They're only loyal to themselves. They lack loyalty. They're not dependable. They're not responsible. So they have some characteristics that you think, well, maybe we could use those in really intense, dangerous professions. But the problem is they're only out for themselves. So they'll, they'll turn on anyone for any uh, reason. On page 62 of the book, it says about psychopaths, obligations and commitments mean nothing to psychopaths. Now, here's the question we got to ask. Can we see that same characteristic in a reprobate? We'll go to Romans 1. Look at verse 31. Without understanding, look at this word, covenant breakers. Now look, what did, the, what did uh, Dr. Hare say about psychopaths? On page 62, he said, obligations and commitments mean nothing to psychopaths. What does the Bible say about reprobates in Romans 1.31? It says they're covenant breakers. You know what that means? Obligations and commitments mean nothing to reprobates. They'll make a covenant with you. They'll make a deal with you. They'll make a vow till death do us part. And to them, it means nothing. They'll commit adultery. They'll do whatever. They'll, 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 because why? Because a reprobate is non-dependable and lacking in loyalty. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Notice what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. Without natural affection. Notice this word. Truce breakers. What does that mean? That means that commitments and agreements mean nothing to them. You'll make a truce, you'll make a deal, they'll break it. Look at verse 4. Traitors! Say, why can't you use them in the military in highly dangerous jobs? Because they're traitors. Because they lack loyalty. Because they're not loyal to anybody except themselves. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 2. You're there in Titus. You're going to go Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 10. Notice what the Bible says. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. What does that mean? That means they despise any authority, any authority in their life. They despise government. Presumptions are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. What's a dignity? A dignity is someone who's in authority over you. And look, a psychopath has no problem just talking about their boss, talking about their pastor, talking about whoever is in authority over them. Why? Because they lack loyalty. They're not loyal. 
Now, again, there's lots of people that aren't loyal. That doesn't make them a psychopath or a reprobate. So, again, you're looking at all of these characteristics as a syndrome in one person. I mean, when you can find one person and you say, I can see how they're covetous. I can see how they're proud. I can see how they lack empathy. I can see how they're not dependable. They can't hold down a job. I can see how they lack loyalty. They're not loyal to anybody. I can see how they're all these things. Hey, you may start thinking to yourself, man, I think so-and-so is a psychopath. That's what the experts do. That's what they do when they, you know, have interviews with these people in prison. And, and here's what's interesting. What, what is that? We are at four out of four. Four of the characteristics of a psychopath, we find all of them and the characteristics of reprobates. You say, why? Because they're psychopath reprobates. Because when you, ha when you cross a line where you have no conscience, then you, you don't care about the, the promises you made, the covenants you've made. You don't care about remorse or guilt. You'll cross lines that other people won't. Other people will look at it and say, wow, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you did that. You just crossed a social norm line. I mean, no normal person would say that or do that. Psychopath will walk right by it. Why? Because there's no remorse or guilt. Right. There's no conscience. Because there's nothing that makes them uh, lack empathy. They're proud, egocentric, grandiose. They think they've got, you know, more of a right to do whatever they want than anybody else. They see themselves as a higher being than anybody else. They're covetous, materialistic. This is a psychopath, and this is a reprobate. Amen. So let's look at the fifth characteristic. Here's the fifth one. Go, uh, let's see, go uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. If you kept your place in Ephesians, if you go backwards, you got Galatians and 2 Corinthians. Here's characteristic number five of a psychopath. They are charming and likable. They are charming and likable. On page 34, the book says this, psychopaths are often witty and articulate. They can be amusing and entertaining conversationalists. Ready and quick and clever, uh, ready and quick and clever comebacks, and can tell unlikely but convincing stories that cast themselves in a good light. They can be very effective in presenting themselves well and are often very likable and charming. On page 38, the book says this they appear charismatic or electrifying to some people. See, you'll look at a psychopath and think, Wow, that is an impressive individual. That's a charming individual. You know, when you first get to know them, before they start ruining your life, you know, before, when you first get to know them, you think, oh, that's a likable person. They're often charming and likable. You say, well, are reprobates like that? Are reprobates someone that you would look at and think, oh, that's a nice person. That's a good person. I like that person. Well, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 13. Notice what the Bible says. For such are false prophets... Now remember, we already identified that false prophets and false teachers are reprobates according to 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 1. So notice what the Bible says about them. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their work. So the Bible tells us about false prophets that they are able to transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. What does that mean? That means when you meet them, you think, oh, that's a nice person. That's a good person. You look at Joe Lostin, he's got a real nice smile. And he, you know, his hair is weird, but his smile is nice and and he looked and he's young you know and, he, and he's this and he's that and you look at him and you say oh they're charming oh they're likable that's what a, a psychopath is and guess what that's also what a reprobate is and look reprobates don't show up and that's what people don't understand sometimes you know we have to deal with issues and situations at church we have to you know uh deal with problems and people think oh but they're so nice but it's like Look, it doesn't matter how nice or charming they give gifts. They're nice people. That doesn't matter it, it, because the Bible says that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And you cannot base, you know, what you think of them on how they look or how they appear. You always have to base it on what are they doing? What are they doing? What is their behavior like? So we have covetousness. We have pride. We have lack of empathy. We have non-dependable. We have charming and likable. Here's number six. Go, go to Titus chapter number one. Here's number six. Glib 
superficial and insincere. Glib, superficial, and insincere. On page 34, um, and we just, read, we just read this, but I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to keep reading a little further from where I stopped from the book. Page 34. Psychopaths are often witty and articulate. They can be amusing and entertaining conversationalists, ready uh, with a quick and clever comeback, and can tell unlikely but convincing stories that cast themselves in a good light. They can be very effective in presenting themselves well and are often very likable and charming. To some people, however, they seem too slick and smooth, too obviously insincere and superficial. One of the characteristics of a psychopath, according to the experts, is that they are glib, superficial, and insincere. Now, the word glib is not a word that we often use in our modern uh, vocabulary today. But here's what the word glib means. It means a slick, fast-talking, or smooth with words, but insincere and shallow. So someone who is glib is someone who's good with their words. They're slick with their words. They're smooth with their words. They're fast talking with their words, but they are also insincere and shallow. Now, here's a question. That's what a psychopath is. So, does the Bible describe a reprobate as someone who's good with their words, but their words are empty, insincere, superficial, what does superficial mean? It means that they're not deep. They're shallow. Does the Bible teach that? Are you there in Titus 1? Look at verse 10. If, if, if you're in, in 2 Timothy, just cross one book over. Titus chapter 1, verse 10. Notice what the Bible says. For there are many unruly. Notice what the Bible says about reprobates. And vain talkers. Notice the emphasis is on their words. They're talkers, but they're not deep talkers. They're not emotional. They're vain. That means they're empty. They're superficial. They are insincere. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 3. Let's see if the Bible describes, you know, reprobates as being glib, superficial, and insincere. Smooth talkers, yet insincere, empty, shallow in their words. 2 Peter 2, 3. And through covetousness shall, don't miss this, they with feign words. What's the word feign mean? It means not real, fake, a fraud, pretend, with feign words. Notice the Bible emphasizes their words, but their words are feign. Their words, but their words are vain. Look at verse 18, same chapter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Does the Bible describe reprobates as glib, smooth talkers, but yet vain and insincere? You know, insincere and superficial? 2 Peter 2.18, for when they speak, notice, don't miss this, great swelling words of vanity. Notice the Bible. It's almost, like these, it's almost like these doctors went to the Bible and just found, you know, what is all the descriptions of a reprobate? Let's put that in a book, call it psychiatry, and sell it. You know, because they say, hey, a psychopath is glib. What's, what's it mean to be glib? Well, it means they're good with their words, they're smooth with their words, they're slick with their words, but their words are insincere. And then you go to the Bible and, you're, and you, know, you kind of think to yourself like, well, that's kind of an interesting way to character. Can the Bible describe someone like that? And then you open up the Bible and God says, hey, a reprobate has a great swelling words of vanity. They're vain with words. They're vain talkers. I mean, that's exactly what glib is. So what do we have? Covetousness, pride, lack of empathy, non-dependable, lacking in loyalty, charming and likable, glib, superficial, and insincere. And look, we're at uh, six and all six we find in the descriptions of a reprobate. Go to 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings 21. In the Old Testament, you got those first and second books, 1 2 Samuel, 1 2 Kings, 1 2 Chronicles. I'm going to use the story in 1 Kings to describe the next, uh, the next uh, characteristic. Here's characteristic number seven. Psychopaths are deceitful and manipulative. Psychopaths are deceitful and manipulative. And by the way, that's why you need to understand they're charming and likable. They're glib, superficial, and insincere. But they're also deceitful and manipulative. So before you get wound up with all their charm and you get wound up with all their stories that are really just vain and great swelling words, realize that they are also deceitful and manipulative. Here's what the book says, page 46, about psychopaths. Lying, deceiving, and manipulation are natural talents for psychopaths. Here's what it says in verse 12 
about a psychopath uh, that, the, that the doctor was working with in prison. He says, Ray had an incredible ability to con not just me, but everybody. He could talk and lie with a smoothness and directness that sometimes momentarily disarmed even the most experienced and cynical of the prison staff. So, so when they look at a psychopath, they say, hey, when someone's a psychopath, they are deceitful and manipulative. So be careful, because they're also likable and charming. They're also glib and superficial and insincere, but they are deceitful and manipulative. Does the Bible teach that about reprobates? Well, let's look at this story in 1 Kings 21. It's a well-known story. You know it, but let's look at it from the lens of reprobates. 1 Kings 21.1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, now Naboth is a good guy in this story, the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the place of Ahab, king of Samaria. Now Ahab is not a good guy, but he's not a reprobate, all right? He's a whiner, but he's not a reprobate. Let's look at it. Look at verse 2. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, now look, what Ahab says is a fair deal. He wants to make a fair deal with Naboth. He says, give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. He says, hey, I want your vineyard. It's near to my house. I'd like to have it, you know. And then he says this, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. He said, I'll give you a better vineyard. I just want that vineyard because it's near to my house. Or, if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. He said, hey, I'll, I'll pay you for it. I'll give you a better vineyard, but I'd like to have your vineyard. Now look, that was a nice deal. That was a fair deal. But Naboth doesn't have to sell his vineyard to anybody he doesn't want to. And he chooses not to. It's his prerogative to do that. Look at verse 3. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, that vineyard's been, uh, it was inherited from my father. It's been in, in, in our family for years. And we were just in Leviticus and we studied how all of that works. And he says, I can't sell you uh, the vineyard. He said, The Lord forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Look at verse 4. And Ahab came unto his house heavy and displeased because the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my father. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. What, what's, Na, what, what's Ahab doing here? He's throwing an adult fit. He's mad. He's, he won't sell me his vineyard. He's mad. I'm not going to eat. You know, I'm upset. Look at verse 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. He said, He, re he went home with his toys. He won't play with me. Look at verse 7. And listen, guys, don't go home and complain to your wives about anything. You have a bad day at work or whatever. Don't be Ahab. Look at verse 7. And Jezebel's wife said unto him, Does thou now govern the kingdom of it? Does thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry, and I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's names, and sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters unto the elders, uh, to the nobles that were in the city dwelling in Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people. She said, Hey, ha have, a, have a, a, a time of rejoicing, and get Naboth out. Set him on high, look at verse 10, and set two men, sons of Belial. Now we already learned that the sons of Belial are reprobates. Seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. Notice, and set two men, sons of Belial. So what do these reprobates do? Because they want the vineyard. But he's, it's not for sale. Notice what the Bible says. And set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of the city, even the elders of the nobles who were the inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him. False accusations here. They witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned them with stones that he died. Now, please listen to me. Taking somebody's life by stoning is a very hard way of killing someone. I mean, 
taking rocks and throwing them at someone till they die. They would do that for rapists. They would do that for pedophiles. They would do that for, for people that hurt other people. And look, if, 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 uh, if, if my children, Lord, you know, God forbid that it never happens, but if my children, or I could understand if somebody's children had been molested, that they would want to kill that individual. Mm-hmm. I would have no problem throwing stones at someone until they died if they molested, you know, someone I loved or raped somebody I loved. You know, and, and look, and if you think, oh, I don't think you should say that, you, you know, you're not normal if you don't feel that way. Amen. Okay, because that's the truth. That's why there should be judgment done to these people. But here's the thing. Could you imagine being a person lying about another person? The person did nothing wrong. All they did wrong was they didn't want to sell their vineyard, which was their prerogative. And you sit there and lie, and with your buddy, we heard him blaspheme God and the king. I mean, could you imagine Nabal saying, what? No, I didn't say that. I didn't blaspheme God. Could you imagine as he's being taken out and he's being stoned to death as he's yelling and saying, no, there's a misunderstanding. That didn't happen. And to have two guys there, sons of Belial, you know the only way you could do that is if you have no conscience, is if you have no empathy, is if you, have, if you just have no remorse and no guilt. But what do these people do, these reprobates? They manipulate and deceive. They lie. They lied about Christ. The Pharisees lied about Christ and put him to death. Why? Because reprobates are deceitful and manipulative. So before you get all into their charm and likability, realize that these people will lie. They'll steal. They'll do whatever they need to do. If they want that vineyard, they're going to get that vineyard. Go to Romans 1.29. Notice what the Bible says. Romans 1.29, the Bible says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, and maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. Notice the word, deceit. They're filled with deceit. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3, without natural affection, truce breakers. Notice what the Bible says, false accusers. Go to Titus chapter 1, look at verse 10. Titus chapter 1 and verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers, notice what it says, and deceivers. So what are the characteristics of a psychopath? Do they match the characteristics of a reprobate? Well, they're both covetous and materialistic. They're both proud, egocentric, and grandiose. They both lack empathy, remorse, or guilt. They're both non-dependable and lacking in loyalty. They're both charming and likable. They're both glib, superficial, and insincere. They're both deceitful and manipulative. What's another characteristic? Go, go, go back to Romans. This time go to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter number 9. Here's another, the eighth characteristic of psychopaths. Let's see if it matches. Oh, oh, they've all matched reprobates so far. Let's see if this one matches reprobates. No fear of consequences. Psychopaths have no fear of consequences. On page 58 of the book, It says this, psychopaths are unlikely to spend much time weighing the pros and cons of a course of action or considering the possible consequences. On page 54, it says this, it is emotional awareness of the consequences that impels us to take a particular course of action. Not so with psychopaths. They barely plunge on, perhaps knowing what might happen, but not really caring. See, psychopaths have no fear of consequences. Does the Bible say that about reprobates? Well, in Romans 9, I want you to go there, because in Romans 9, we learn about a famous reprobate in the Bible, and that is Pharaoh. From the story of Moses, when he delivered the people out of Egypt in Exodus, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh was a reprobate. Look at Romans 9, 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared through all the earth. You say, what does that mean? Here's what it means. God says, the reason that Pharaoh was lifted up, the reason that he was placed in the position of Pharaoh in Egypt was because he was a reprobate. What's a reprobate? There's someone who's exposed to the truth but resists the truth. They're exposed to the truth but deny the truth. They're exposed to the truth but reject the truth. You say, well, why would God put a reprobate there in the story of Moses? Here's why. Because here's why God knew that a reprobate would react to the plagues of Egypt. Go to Exodus chapter 10. I mean, if you were the king of Egypt... How many plagues would you have to go through before you decided, okay, you know what, God, you win? 
I mean, I think most of us are probably, you know, once you're like at two, three, four, I mean, once you're at three, you probably think like, okay, you win, uncle, but, but why didn't Pharaoh do it? Because he's a reprobate? Because he's never going to submit to God. He's, never go, he's always going to reject it. And here's what he does. He lies and deceives, right? He tells Moses, okay, stop the frogs or stop the hail or stop this and I'll let the people go. But as soon as the plagues were gone, he changed his mind. No, I will not let the people go. You know, the only person that would act like that's a reprobate. The only person that would act like that, you say, why? Because they have no fear of consequences. Look at Exodus 10 and verse 7. Notice what the Bible says. And Pharaoh's servant said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let them go that they may serve the Lord their God. Notice what the servants are saying to Pharaoh. They're saying, Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? He said, don't you look around. Can't you see that your decisions are causing Egypt to get destroyed? But listen to me. Psychopaths are unlikely to spend much time weighing pros and cons of a course of action or considering the possible consequences. Psychopaths are not like normal people that will look at consequences and cause them to take a particular course. No, not psychopaths. They merely plunge on, perhaps knowing what might happen, but not really caring. Isn't that Pharaoh? I mean, you got to think, there's probably another play coming. By the time there's five or six, you know, but he's just plunging on ahead, not really caring. His people are pleading and saying, no, is that not that Egypt is destroyed? But he was a reprobate. And it's the same thing for psychopaths. They have no fear of consequences. Let's go, go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter 2.10. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government, notice what it says, presumptuous are they self-willed. Notice these words, they are not afraid. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Why? Because psychopaths have no fear of consequences. And you know what? Neither do reprobates. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. They're not afraid to do whatever they want. Go to Jude 1. Jude in verse 12. Jude 12, verse 12. Notice what it says. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. So look, psychopaths, we're told by the experts, have no fear of consequences. But you know what? The Bible says that reprobates have no fear. They're not afraid. They don't consider the pros and cons and think, you know what? Maybe after seven plagues, Maybe I should just let them go. No, they just plunge on ahead. Go to Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter one. Let me give you the ninth characteristic of a psychopath. The ninth characteristic of a psychopath. Without self-control or restraint. Without self-control or restraint. Here's what the book says, page 58. Impulsive acts often result from an aim that plays at a central role in most of the psychopath's behavior. To achieve immediate satisfaction, pleasure, or relief. The psychopath is like an infant, absorbed in his own need, vehemently demanding satiation. Here we're told that, look, they, they want, their only goal is to achieve immediate satisfaction, pleasure, or relief. They are without self-control, without restraint. They can't stop themselves from doing what they want to do. So here's a question. A psychopath is without self-control or restraint. Are reprobates without self-control or restraint? Romans 1, look at verse 31. Romans 1, 31. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural reflection. Notice this word, implacable. See that word implacable? What's the word implacable mean? It means not to be appeased, mollified, or pacified. See, when a reprobate wants something, you can't talk them out of it. They're going to get it. They can't be appeased. They can't be mollified. They can't be pacified. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. Without natural affliction, truth speakers, false accusers. Notice this word, incontinent. Incontinent. What does the word incontinent mean? It means lacking in moderation or self-control, especially of sexual desires. It means lacking in moderation or self-control. So the experts say, hey, psychopaths are without self-control or restraint. The Bible says that reprobates are incontinent, which means 
lacking in self-control. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 14. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14. 2 Peter 2, 14, having eyes full of adultery. Having eyes full of adultery. Don't miss this. And that cannot cease from sin. Look, they couldn't stop if they wanted to. Why? Because they have no restraint. They have no self-control. They are implacable. They are incontinent. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Let me give you the last one. So, so far I've given you nine characteristics for a psychopath, and don't reprobates match them just exactly to the T? I mean, it's almost like God knew what he, you know, everything about anything that happens on this earth. It's almost, almost like God knows everything. It's almost like the Bible knows everything about everything. Amen. Amen. And, and all we need to do is study the Bible to learn about. And, and people say like, ah, oh, you guys believe on these reprobates. I can't believe that you would believe that. And it's like, looks, psychiatrists believe in them too. They just call them psychopaths. Right. Let me give you the last one. No sexual morals. No sexual morals. When you talk to a psychiatrist about the characteristics of a psychopath, one of the things they're going to say to you is they have no sexual morals. Page 45 of the book, writing about a psychopath, he says this, they were engaging in an unending series of casual, impersonal, and trivial sexual relationships, and so forth. They have no sexual morals. They'll just do whatever with whoever. Does the Bible say that about reprobates? We'll go to Romans 1. Look at verse 29. Romans 1, 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, notice fornication. These people are, you know, overcome with fornication. Keep your place in Romans 1. We're going to come right back to it. Go to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. Look at verse 6. 2 Timothy 3, verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. They creep in the houses and lead captive silly, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10. 2 Peter 2.10 says, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14. Notice what the Bible says. Having eyes full of adultery. Eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. Notice what it says. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Go to Jude and verse 16. Jude chapter 1, the only chapter, verse 16. Jude 1, 16. And these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. Walking after their own lusts. Look at verse 18. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Look at Jude one nineteen. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. Now here's what's interesting. Go, go back to Romans chapter 1. Here's what's interesting as I was reading this book. I noticed that there's an emphasis in this book, and I'm not saying that the writer did this on purpose. It just it stood out to me a lot that he would talk about the fact that these people have no uh, sexual morals, but he would often bring up the fact that these people were either homosexuals or pedophiles, that they were sodomites and they were pedophiles. And I don't think he did it on purpose because he never really mentioned, you know, hey, a characteristic is these guys are homos. But it seems like every time you read a story, it just comes out that they're a pedophile, that they're a homo. Let me read to you a little bit. Go back to Romans 1, page 11. He's talking about how a psychopath pulled a knife out during a counseling session. This is in prison. This guy made a knife. He's counseling with them, and the guy pulls a knife out. Here's what he says. He says, he explained that he intended to use the knife not on me, but on another inmate who had been making overtures to his protege, a prison term for the more passive member of a homosexual pairing. In page 100, he said this, writing about a psychopath. He said, he routinely terrorized and assaulted the women in his life, sexually abused his daughter, and raped her girlfriend. He, his propensities for sadist sexual behavior carry over into prison, where he is well known for his aggressive homosexuality. In page 93, he wrote this, John Otten, 
called the paperback rapist by Vancouver Press. He, wrote, he wore a paper bag over his head when he raped children and women. Otten was diagnosed by a court psychiatrist as both a psychopath, lack a conscience, is manipulative, egocentric, untruthful, and lacks the capacity for love, and a sexual sadist who gets sexual excitement by inflicting psychological pressure on his victim. In page 108, uh, writing about a psychopath's imprisonment, he said this, he, that he was in prison for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old female cousin. In, per, in page 110, he, talks, he says this, psychopathic abusers are unmoved. I just take what's available, said one of the subjects convicted of sexually assaulting his girlfriend's 8-year-old daughter. You say, psychopaths, the experts, what they keep highlighting for us is these people are with no, no sexual morals, sexual deviance. They are homosexuals, they are sodomites, and they are pedophiles. So here's the question. Does the Bible say that about reprobates? Well, let's go to Romans 1, verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up, un, up to uncleanness. Notice, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, notice, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. It's vile. It's not something to be proud of. It's not something to parade about. He says, unto vile affection. For even their women did change, notice, notice, the natural use into that which is against nature. Listen to me. It's not normal. It's unnatural. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. And you can write right next to that verse. You know what you can write? You can write the word AIDS. That's the recompense of their error, which was meat. And you say, oh, you know, and people, I get sick and tired of this, because people say like, oh, you are constantly, you know, equating a homosexual to a pedophile. You know, you shouldn't do that. Well, here's what's interesting. These guys do. They say, hey, psychopaths, they'll rape a woman, they'll rape a man, they'll rape a child. The psychopaths will tell you, I'll take whatever's available. And you know, people say like, well, you can't say it just because they're a sodomite, they're a pedophile. Listen to me. When you start going down the road of doing unnatural sins, listen to me very carefully. By the time a man gets to the place where he'll go to bed with another man, I'm here to tell you, he'll do anything. He'll rape a child. He'll rape a corpse. He'll, he'll rape an animal. And look, that's why God said these people are worthy of death. And, you know, I'm tired of Christians just deciding that they don't want to believe, obey the Bible. They don't want to believe the Bible. Look, and people, people will say, well, you know, I got one of them in my family. We all got one of them in our family. Well, I work with one. Look, if you work with one, they're worthy of death. Amen. I, I live next to one. Watch your kids, and they're worthy of death. Say, oh, well, you know, what, what if it's my uncle? They're worthy of death. What if it's my cousin? They're worthy of death. What if it's my sibling? They're worthy of death. What if it's my, listen, I don't care if it's your Siamese twin. They're worthy of death. That's what the Bible says. Why? Because they're unnatural. Their conscience is seared. I mean, how much more do you have to study about these people before you realize we don't need to be anywhere around these people? Amen. They are dangerous. They will rape and kill and by their own admission take whatever's available. And didn't we see that in Judges 19? They want to rape the guy. He's not available. They throw out the concubine. They rape her till she dies. That's what Judges 19 says. Some of you should read your Bibles. Genesis 19, they want to rape a guy. You say, why? Because they're psychopath reprobates. That's why. And, and you say, well, I can't believe you'd say that. I can't believe you'd preach that. We're going to get, you know, uh, 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 you know, people out here protesting us. All those people are a bunch of pedophiles themselves. They want to reprobate themselves. They're mad. They're mad because we're calling them out. You know, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And look, no normal, natural, hair-legged man thinks it's anywhere near normal to go to bed with another man. It's unnatural. It's not normal. I, you say, well, do you think that sodomites are pedophiles? Yeah, I do. You know, that's what you say, well, you were just sad when they died in, in Orlando. No, I'm not sad when pedophiles and rapists die. Amen. It doesn't break. I don't, I don't shed a tear over it. Why? You say, why? Because I know what they do. Because I know what they can produce. 
Because the word of God tells us. And you, you say, well, you, I, I, don't know, I don't know that I can handle that. I can't take it from you. Okay, well, can you take it from him? Just a regular, well-educated, well-respected scientist who says, here's what he says. He says, hey, if you, run around, if you run across a psychopath, be careful with your children. If you run across a psychopath, they might look charming. They might look nice. But they are sexual deviants. They are without self-control or restraint. They have no fear of consequences. They are deceitful and manipulative. They are glib, superficial, and sincere. They're charming and likable. They're non-dependable and lacking in loyalty. They are proud. They are covetous. They lack empathy. And, and, then, and then I look at the Word of God and I say, good night. I think this guy's been reading Romans chapter number one. I'm reading this book, and it sounds to me like 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 2 Peter chapter 2 and Jude 1. It sounds like the Word of God is what it sounds like. Right. You say, why? Because they're psychopath reprobates. Psychiatrists are just now learning about how to identify these people. Let me read to you a couple more things that will be done. Here's what the book says. He says, although these and related questions have been the focus of clinical speculations and empirical research for over 100 years, one of, and of my own work for a quarter century. It is primarily within the last few decades that the deadly mystery of the psychopaths has begun to reveal itself. He also said this, this book confronts psychopathy head on and presents the disturbing topic for what it is, a dark mystery with staggering implications for society, a mystery that finally is being, beginning to reveal itself after centuries of speculation and decades and empirical psychological research. You know what the psychiatrists are saying? They're saying, after decades, after centuries, we are finally now beginning to shed light on the fact that there's a class of people who live among us. They have no conscience. They're predators. They're liars. They're false accusers. They'll stab you in the back. They're saying, we're just now starting to figure it out. You know what's interesting? Paul had it figured out 2,000 years ago. The Bible wrote about it 5,000 years ago. You say, why preach the sermon? You know, one of the reasons that we should preach the sermon, just to remind ourselves that the Word of God is all we need. Amen. The, law of the, word is, the law of the Lord is perfect. Right, right. And it has everything we need. And you know what? And here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. People hate the Word of God. Right, right. They hate what the Word of God says. I get up here and I preach, hey, you know what? The Bible says there's a bunch of people that are without a conscience. They'll rape you and they'll kill you and they don't care. And they'll say, you're a hate monger. You're a hate preacher. We should protest you. But a psychiatrist writes a book and says the same thing. And people are like, oh, let's give him an award. Let's name an achievement award after him. I wish they'd name an achievement award after me. <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't even spend the four years in college. I just read the word of God. I just read the Bible because the law of the Lord is perfect. Amen. So what do you think about psychopaths? Here's what I think about psychopaths. I think they're reprobates. Amen. What do you think about reprobates? Well, here's what I think about reprobates. I think they're psychopaths. Amen. What do you think about these people? Well, they're psychopath reprobates. Be careful. Be careful. Right. Spire heads. Heavenly Father.